sponsor of the fair tax himself, and that's Congressman Woodall from the great state of Georgia. Congressman Woodall, share us with us a little bit about the fair tax and how it impacts small businesses and how it would help them. Mr. Graves, I appreciate uh, you doing this time uh, tonight. Folks ask me, they say, what goes on in the, uh, in the evenings there on Capitol Hill when you, when you finish the votes for the day? What goes on next? And I say, well, folks are all back in their office working, just like small business folks across the country. <laughs> but just because the, the customers leave doesn't mean the doors close. Folks are still working. And, and this is that time where we get to come down and really fully debate some of these ideas. If folks have been watching all day today, we've been talking about transportation policy. We've been talking about Mark Twain a little bit. We've been, uh, been talking about the rules of the process, but we hadn't gotten to talk about, about small businesses. You know, when we talk about economic growth in this country, you're from the great state of, of Georgia as I am, and we've got some fantastic big companies there. Uh, UPS is there doing fantastic things. Uh, folks dressed in brown. Delta Airlines is there uh, uh, carrying more passengers than, than anybody else in the, in the country. We've got Coca-Cola there, a brand name that's known the, the world around. Home Depot, Big Orange that everybody understands. But that is not where the jobs come from. The jobs come from those small businessmen and women who risk everything everything to believe that by the, the sweat of their brow and the power of their ideas, they can make their tomorrow better than, than today. And that letter that you got from your constituent, uh, Mr. Graves, is exactly the kind of letter that I get from folks every single day that say, Rob, I don't mind paying the taxes. I understand part of the social contract is the government has to run, but it doesn't have to be this painful. We can do it in a better way in H.R. 25, the fair tax, of which you were a proud co-sponsor, a huge huge leader on that bill, is the single most popularly co-sponsored piece of fundamental tax reform legislation in either the U.S. House or the U.S. Senate because voters are demanding it That's one right. member of Congress at the time. Mm. Well, I thank you for your leadership on that, and I see we've been joined by chairman here of Rules from California. Chairman, thank you for joining us. Well, I thank my friend for yielding, and uh, I, I, um, I, I appreciate his yielding, and the reason I've come to the floor is to uh, share with our colleagues the very sad news of the passing of my, uh, my very close friend, Dick Clark, who just within the past uh, couple of hours, it's been reported, passed away. When I listed the topic of your discussion, I'm reminded of a con I had dinner with him two weeks ago, and he was somebody who said exactly what my friend from Georgia indicated. He was a proud taxpayer, and I know people are going to be talking about American Bandstand. This is someone who actually uh, broke the barrier by bringing African Americans onto television in the 1950s and the 1960s. He's someone who uh, was an amazingly successful businessman. He was a small businessman himself, but a very, very successful one. And um, I just want to say that I, as I listened to your discussion, I was reminded of how he regularly said everyone should pay their fair share of taxes. And I, he, he said that not too long ago uh, to me, and uh, I said I appreciate that because he knew he was paying my salary, uh, and yours and yours as well. Um, but I, I just want to share with our colleagues what a, a great loss this is for our country. The, the show that he, uh, that he started and or initially became so famous for was American Bandstand. And I think it's a very appropriate one because this guy was a very patriotic American. He was a believer in the free enterprise system. He was a believer in encouraging individual initiative and opportunity on a, on a regular basis. And he's someone who provided inspiration to people all the way across the spectrum. And I just wanted to say that as you guys are here talking about the need for tax fairness, and the imperative to ensure that we encourage more people like Dick Clark. I think it's important for us to uh, remember uh, the wonderful life that this man had. And I've got to say just a couple of things, if I, if I might. He, uh, he uh, was someone who, uh, you all recall, on New Year's Eve would regularly host up in Times Square. And in 2004, he suffered a massive stroke. And uh, I've never seen anyone with more determination and fight than Dick Clark. A number of people said, gosh, why did Dick Clark continue to, to go out and be on television? Well, you know what? People all across this country, and I had a conversation with him just before he decided to go uh, this past fall to do this program. People across this country said to him, the fact that you have suffered this stroke and are continuing to fight to get better 
and continue to be active is something that is an insp inspiration to us. And so that kind of fighting spirit is exactly what the small business men and women who are this hour still working, and my friend was just talking about, and the imperative to make sure that everyone pays their taxes but no more uh, is something that uh, I think should, he should be remembered for, along with all of the great, great accomplishments that he had. And I thank my friend for yielding, and I just wanted to take this moment to uh, share this with our colleagues here in the House. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for Thanks. sharing that with us. And, and, and you're right. You, you talk about small business owners. They're going to work extremely hard. They get up early every day. They work late every night. They're going to pay their fair share. They just want to know it's being handled properly and that it's being fairly collected. But, you know, Mr. Woodall, I hear criticisms every now and then about the fair tax. I'm a co-sponsor of it. I hear criticism here and there. They say, well, this will impact one group more than another. How can something called the fair tax not be fair to everyone? How do you refute that when, when, when they come up with the criticisms to the fair tax and when actually I guess when they're criticizing the fair tax they're defending the current tax code and the 60,000 pages of mess that we currently have, the loopholes and the corporate welfare, they must be defending that. But how do you, how do you respond to the criticisms that you well, have? I appreciate the, the gentleman for yielding because that is what's so amazing about small business folks. I mean, you, you, you never have a small business person come into your office and say, Rob, what I want is a, is a leg up on everybody else. I want an unfair playing field so I can beat all my competition. That's not who our small business owners are. Our small business owners are people who say, Rob, give me a level playing field and I will outcompete anybody in any nation around the globe because nobody works harder and has more powerful ideas than does the American worker. Well, that's what the fair tax is all about. It says... Let's create a level playing field. It, my, my friend is, a, uh, is not a freshman as I am. He got here six months earlier in a special election they had to work incredibly hard uh, for. But those of us who are newer to this institution, as you and I are, know there are some folks here who like using the tax code to pick winners and losers. I mean, it's an easy thing to do. I, I look around this body. I can, I can find some examples. I see fluorescent lights uh, here in the chamber. Uh, I could put a huge tax on fluorescent lights so we would never have any more fluorescent lights. I could, I could put a huge tax on, on plaid shirts so we never have any more plaid <laughs> shirts. That is what happens with the tax code. But the fair tax says no. It says we're going to have a single tax a single tax rate on everything the consumer buys. You're going to be taxed on everything once, but only once, because those small businessmen and women who write those letters to your office and to mine say, Rob, I spend more time trying to figure out tax decisions than I do figuring out business decisions. And when these are the men and women who employ so many of our friends and neighbors, when these are the men and women who create the job growth in this country, we have to have them focused on, on business decisions, not tax decisions, and the fair tax does that. Well, thank you, and I hope you'll stick around, and I'm going to in a minute yield to the gentleman from Ohio. And, and just to make clear, I mean, the fair tax is not an additional tax. It's not something that is added on a layer. It's actually eliminating income tax, eliminating corporate income tax, eliminating capital gains tax, dividend tax, death tax, eliminating all of it, throwing it all out, I guess eliminating the Internal Revenue Service for some part in, 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 in a great way. And, uh, and I think there would be a lot of Americans across the country applauding on that day if that were to ever occur. Uh, next with us tonight is uh, Chairman of the Republican Study Committee, a great leader on conservative principles, a great mind when it comes to policy, and I know a great advocate for uh, uh, tax reform, regardless of fair or flat or whatever it is. It's about empowering the taxpayer and not empowering the government. And uh, with us tonight is uh, Congressman Jim Jordan from Ohio. Thank I you. I thank the, uh, the gentleman for uh, yielding, and I thank him more importantly for his leadership here in the Congress. Uh, and, and you said it right. Uh, you said it well. Wh whatever you're, whether you're for a uh, fair tax, whether you're for a flat tax, uh, one thing is certain. The American people have had it with the current tax code. I mean, think about this. Any tax code that allows 47% of the population not to pay, 47% of the citizens not to pay, 47% of all the people who live in this country not to pay the main tax, the income tax that we have, you can't repair it, you can't fix it, it's completely broke, you've got to throw it away and start over. Any tax code 
that now requires our companies headquartered in the United States of America to pay the highest corporate tax rate in the world is broken. So the, the fact is, it, you know, this is one thing that's amazing to me. We're talking about small business. We're talking about tax policy. What's amazing to me is in spite of stupid policies from the federal government, how well our business, small business owners do. It's a testimony to what Mr. Woodall was talking about, the work ethic and the entrepreneurship of the American people and the American small business owner, that in spite of bad policies, they're still succeeding. Imagine, imagine if we had tax policy that actually made sense. Imagine if we had a regulatory environment that made sense. Imagine if we had an energy policy that made some sense and used the resources the good Lord has blessed us with in this country. Imagine if we had monetary and fiscal policy that made sense. Could you imagine what kind of growth? We wouldn't have you having one and a half, two percent growth. We'd be having three, four, five percent growth in this economy. And as you said, uh, 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 Mr. Chair, the, the creating an environment that's conducive to economic growth, if we actually did that, Get out of the way. Mm -hmm. Let the American entrepreneur, let the American family, let the American small business owner do what they've been doing for 200 plus years, making good things happen, growing our economy, creating jobs, helping our communities, and making us the greatest nation in the world. That's what's at stake here. And it does start with the policies that we have here at the federal government. So we need to change this tax code, change the regulatory environment, and certainly change our ener energy policy and start getting spending under control. And if we have a chance, we'll talk about that here in just a few minutes. But I know we've got another speaker who we want to get to. So I'll yield back to the gentleman from Georgia. Well, thank you, thank you, uh, Chairman Jordan. And, and, and you're, you're absolutely right about the small business owners. I mean, they don't want equal outcomes. They just want an equal opportunity. That's what it's all about. That is the American dream. That's American exceptionalism. Just give me a chance and I will beat the next guy, the next nation. We are more competitive. It, when we, and when we have that more competitive advantage and it's a level playing field, we will win every time. That is the, the spirit of the small business owner. And speaking of spirit and small business owner, we have joining us also tonight is uh, uh, Jeff Landry from Louisiana. And I uh, thank you for joining us, and I uh, look forward to hearing your insight. Well, I thank, I thank the gentleman for yielding. You know, Mr. Speaker, this week marks another tax day, culminating another year that Americans have been subjected to an outdated and overcomplicated tax code. Three years ago on tax day, I attended the first Tea Party rally in my hometown in New Iberia, fed up with an overreaching government and fed up with an overburdensome tax code. As a small business owner in the oil and gas industry, I have created jobs, I have made payroll, I have paid insurance, I have balanced budgets. I did these things like the majority of small businesses out there across America, with hard work, determination, and of course a fantastic accountant, you know, to sift through the three million 837,105 words of the United States tax code. Mr. Speaker, it's no secret that small businesses are the real drivers of our economy. To date, small businesses employ half of the U.S. workers, and despite our lagging recovery, they have managed to generate nearly 65% of all of the new jobs created over the past 15 years, often outperforming their larger counterparts. I often speak with business owners, small business owners in my district. The one word I hear again and again from them is uncertainty. From looming health care mandates to volatile energy prices, American small businesses simply don't know what to expect. To the farmer out there who's watching his energy prices and his fertilizer prices increase, to the small business owner trying to determine if hiring that new talent is, is the responsible thing to do to building a new factory? The uncertainty of the, uh, in the current environment is what is keeping them from expanding and from what's keeping them from creating jobs. You know, the oil and gas industry is a classic example, and I'm not talking about big oil. I'm talking about nearly the 18,000 independent oil and gas producers here in this country who are small business owners. These small business owners develop 95% of all oil and gas wells, produce 68% of America's oil, produce 82% of America's gas. In total, America's onshore independent oil and gas small businesses support 2.1 million 
direct jobs here in the United States in 2010. In my state alone, over 47,000 people are employed directly by the oil and gas sector. When you add that and other aspects of the oil and gas industry, the refining transportation pipeline, there are over 111,000 people in the state of Louisiana directly employed by the oil and gas industry. And just like every other small business, these businesses, the ones that literally fuel America, are faced with a crushing tax burden that threatens their very survival. And they hear from our president who has threatened to take away parts of the tax code that helps them. And I'm not talking about big oil subsidies. I'm not talking about lowering the corporate tax rate either. Believe it or not, most of our domestic energy producers in, the, in this, they don't, they, they, sit, they, don't, they don't pay that corporate tax rate. They don't get a subsidy. They don't get a direct check from the government. They simply are taking advantage of the same uh, uh, credits out there that other small businesses around this, this, this country uh, partake in. Logically, then when most small businesses deduct their expenses, these small businesses deduct theirs as well. These independent producers, like other small businesses, like I said, do not receive a direct check from the government. Instead, it's a cost of doing business. Without the ability to expense these ordinary and necessary business costs, an independent producer would have to reduce its drilling budget by 20 to 35 percent almost immediately, bringing a drastic decrease of energy production here in this country. Without this reinvestment, U.S. production would decline rapidly because wells depleted are needed to be replaced. Americans cannot afford a decrease in energy production, and small, and all, small oil and gas businesses cannot afford a tax hike. Tax hikes would also hurt American retirees who mutual funds, pension plans, and IRAs are invested in these publicly traded oil and gas companies, all the while harming American energy. Look, with so much uncertainty being created here in Washington, the threat of billions of dollars in new job-crushing tax hikes, a federal takeover of hydraulic fracturing or regulations, less access to taxpayer-owned energy resources, that's a, our federal lands, the permitting process still lagging, the cost of doing business continues to be challenging. Mr. Speaker, Washington can do better. We can do better. We owe it to our small business owners in every industry to provide for a basic sense of consistency and certainty in our tax code. Tomorrow, the House will consider the Small Business Tax Cut Act, legislation that would allow small businesses to deduct 20 percent of their active income in order to retain more capital and create more jobs. I congratulate our majority leader for bringing this bill to the floor. I'm confident that with this strong step in the right direction, we will, continue to, and we will continue to work to make sure that our small businesses have the certainty they need to grow and to thrive. I thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I yield back. Well, I thank the gentleman from Louisiana for sharing your insight tonight, and, and you're absolutely right. You brought up some, some great points about small business owners. All the things they do that the government never does. They get up every day early, they work hard and long. They know how to balance budgets, they have paychecks, they pay their taxes. They have to every day be held accountable by the consumer with their good. Is it meeting the, the demands of the consumer? Is it uh, the customer service there? Every day they're held accountable and every day they get up with that desire and that drive to produce a better product, a better good, and provide a better service. And uh, what a great tribute to the small business owners across America. And uh, with that, I'd like to uh, uh, shift over to uh, Mr. Hanna from New York, who uh, is going <clears> to <throat> share with us about small businesses uh, in his region. And I want to thank you for joining us and appreciate your leadership on this issue. Uh, I thank the gentleman for yielding. Mr. Speaker, small businesses are the lifeblood of our economy. They are the catalyst for job growth and job creation all across our nation. They certainly are in upstate New York where I started my own small business some 30 years ago, which I ran successfully for that same period of time, employing hundreds of people from my community, friends and neighbors to this day. Unemployment is still too high. It's over 8 percent in my home state of New York. Our constituents want to go back to work. They just need the opportunity. 
That's what I heard from small business owners when I hosted a meeting of the Central New York Business Network earlier this month. Government can help advancing, by advancing policies that enable our 27 million small businesses to do what they do best, compete and create jobs. There is no silver bullet, but there are solutions that we can work together on starting today. Here are a few. Tax relief. Small businesses in America pay some of the highest taxes in the world, and the associated regulations are also an enormous barrier to growth. The average tax compliant, compliance cost per employee for small businesses is three times what it is for large businesses. We need to make taxes lower, fairer, more predictable, and generally more understandable. We'll be voting on a bill of this nature sometime this week. Freedom from government competition. Too many of our small businesses find themselves pitted against their own government when it comes to doing commercial work like landscaping, construction, and engineering. We should require federal agencies to use the private sector when providing goods and services that are available in the open marketplace. This gives small businesses in our community a chance to work efficiently and create jobs. And this has been shown to, to save taxpayers money. Finally, and most importantly, a jobs-based education policy. A major root cause of our long-term unemployment is the changing nature of the global marketplace. We are competing, competing against developing countries like never before. Competition isn't bad, but we need to be better prepared. In order to maintain a high standard of living, we need to cultivate the value-added, knowledge-based, innovative sector of our economy. This can only be achieved through education and a new focus on the, on the fields of science, technology, engineering, and math, also known as STEM. STEM jobs, on the average, pay 27 percent more than non-STEM jobs. The only effective long-term way to rebuild the middle class is through education. It's been this way since the dawn of time. With better paying tax generating jobs that provide at least those basics of the American dream, a home, a college education for your children, and a dignified retirement. Mr. Speaker, there are a few tasks more important than helping small businesses put our neighbors and friends back to work in America. Let's join to work on pro-growth policies that will enable them to do just that. I thank you and I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Hanna. I appreciate uh, your plea there. Let's get government out of the way. Let's let small business owners do what they do best, and that is dream big and work hard. And next to share with us is Mr. Bartlett from Maryland. Thank you. Thank you very much for yielding. I'd like to spend just a uh, couple of minutes putting this uh, discussion in, in context. I'm from uh, Maryland. I've been there 51 years now, and for 12 years, my wife and I ran a small business meeting, a payroll every Wednesday morning. That's pretty good uh, uh, discipline. I wanted to give you some statistics from Maryland. Now, we're an average, a little smaller than an average state. We have only eight representatives in the Congress. We have something over five million people. But in our little state, we have 100 and 6,441 small businesses. That is a lot of individual businesses. They have between one and 500 employees, and they totally employ 1,105,200 individuals. Now, this is in a little state like Maryland. It's interesting to see who employs these people. The top three industries by employment, over 157,000 in health care and social assistance one of the most rapidly growing segments of our society, which we have to uh, kind of calm down or we won't be able to afford it. Over 135,000 employees in professional, scientific, and technical services, and Maryland is probably either number two or number three in biotech in the whole country, so we're proud of that. And we have 133,000 employees in construction. That's down. We used to have more than that, of course, and hoping to have more in the future. According to the Census Bureau of the Small Businesses in Maryland, 15,717 are women-owned, and they employ 147,751 employees. I would just like to note that before the recent increase in employment in 
Hispanic small businesses, that women-owned small businesses who are the fastest growing small businesses in our country. They are better employers than men. Men and women are different. Our military has a little trouble figuring that out sometimes, but they are different. And they are ranked to be better employers by their employees. So let's, let's uh, give a wave to, to, to our women who are entering the, the small business community. And to, in addition to this, uh, to these small businesses in 209, Maryland was home to 365,492 sole proprietorships. These are small businesses with one person in them, sole proprietorships. Many of these self-employed small businesses also benefit from the 20% small business tax cut in H.R. 9, which is one of the things we're focusing on this evening because I understand that we're voting on that tomorrow. A couple of interesting statistics. Between uh, 05 and 08, small business created a net total of 63,576 new jobs in Maryland, but in just 08 and 09, we lost 57,433, so we just are barely up in small businesses now because of, because of, of, of how, how many of those small businesses we, uh, we lost. Uh, one of the previous speakers mentioned, mentioned the tax code and how we need to make it simpler and fairer. Let's just talk about the fair tax for just a moment, then I'm going to yield. If we went to the fair tax, that's a tax on consumption. And let's repeal the 16th Amendment. Don't give the government any chance to ever come back with a, with a personal income tax again. If we did that, we could have a bigger tax revenue with no increase in tax burden. Because the tax burden today is not just the taxes you pay. It's the 200, the 200 billion dollars that it costs businesses and individuals across our country every year to comply with the code. And I don't know anybody out there who wouldn't be happy to roll that, that, that compliance cost in, in, into the tax burden so that now the revenues will go up with no increase in tax burden. That's one of the things that we need to do to balance the budget. So if we just went to the fair tax with no increase in tax burden, we'd have $200 billion a year more money flowing into the U.S. Treasury. And small business will be a big part of this. Thank you for yielding, and I yield back. Well, thank you. Thank you. I, I appreciate your words there. Um, and as I wrap up this segment that, uh, that, that we have here this evening, I just want to say thank you to the small business owners across America. You've heard, uh, you've heard great reports from members of Congress who are with you, who are fighting with you and fighting for you. But we just want to thank you because every day you're getting up and you're going against some of the greatest pressures and the greatest burdens that a government could ever place on you, but you don't give up. You get up each day, you put the boots on, you go out and you work hard. You take that dream, that idea, that concept, and you build it into reality and you're building jobs and you're providing for other families and we want to thank you for that. And while the uh, optimism index is getting lower, the misery index is getting higher, I'm here to tell you Americans have not given up. Small business owners have not given up. In fact, statistics show that if just one out of two businesses across this nation hired one person in the next 12 months, unemployment would be near zero. That's how close we are because small business owners haven't given up, and I want to thank you for that. I want to applaud you for that and keep up the great fight. And with that, Mr. Speaker, I yield back. <clears throat> Under the Speaker's announced policy of January 5th, 2011, the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Shavit, is recognized for 28 minutes as the designee of the Majority Leader. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I appreciate that. And uh, I really appreciate uh, Chairman Graves making it possible for so many of us who care about small business in this country uh, this evening to take a little time to talk about how important it is, uh, what we ought to be doing to support our small business folks all over the country. Uh, after all, 70 percent of the jobs that are created historically in the American economy uh, aren't the big guys. They're not the huge corporations, although we want them to do well and hire a lot of people. Um, but even though a lot of people think, well, it's the, the huge uh, uh, corporations that are, that are doing all the hiring, it's really small business folks. It's mom and pop's places. It's people that have fewer than 500 employees, oftentimes fewer than 50. Sometimes it's five or even one. Um, these are the folks that historically have created 70 percent of the jobs. And unfortunately, uh, I would argue that this administration and the policies that are, have been implemented uh, for many of the folks on the other side of the aisle, unfortunately, have, have made it very challenging uh, to these small businesses to be successful, uh, to hire 
additional employees and, and there's a whole range of issues that we're going to talk about this evening. We have limited time and so I'm going to turn it over to a couple of my colleagues. I'd like to uh, first recognize uh, the gentleman from Arizona, David Schweikert, who's been a leader in trying to come up with uh, policies that will be supportive for uh, small businesses uh, in this country. So I'd like to yield uh, such, uh, we'll, uh, yield five minutes uh, to the gentleman from Arizona, Mr. Schweikert. Did you want this here? I think okay. It may be okay. Very good. To do right here. And Mr. Speaker, and to my friend, thank you for yielding me a few minutes here. Um, one of the reasons I'm standing here is, over the last week, we've heard the president talk about what we call the Buffett Rule, and the Senate you know, in its failure to move the Buffett rule, thank heaven, and realizing for a lot of Americans they don't understand this is, A, it's absolutely pretend math, but it's also meant as an absolute attack on the entrepreneurs, on the wealth creators, and the people who create jobs and economic growth in this country. So I thought I would do another one of my clocks to try to help folks understand the reality of the math. Okay, think about this. We borrow about $3.5 billion every single day, which is actually an improvement from where we've been, but $3.5 billion every day. There's what, 1,440 minutes in a day. So we were trying to figure out how do you explain how little the Buffett rule does to help us in our debt crisis, but how much damage it will ultimately do to our economic growth. And where this came from is two days ago my phone rang. And I had a gentleman from my district who was absolutely insistent that the Buffett rule would solve the debt problem. So we made a clock. And here it is. If you think about how much we borrow in a single day, that $3.5 billion in a day, how much would the Buffett rule, with our math, how much of that day would it cover of the debt? Remember, 1,440 minutes in a day. It would cover 3.5 minutes of borrowing in a day. It's fantasy. So why does the left, why does this president engage in this sort of political theater? Maybe because it's good politics, but it's really crappy math. And here's the reality of our future, and, and this keeps coming back and why we so desperately have to do those things to get our small businesses to start hiring and growing. But we here in the federal government, we here in Congress are going to have to deal with a reality that's coming at us like a freight train. This year, 63% of all of our spending is Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, interest on the debt, veterans benefits. In four and a half years, so the 2017 budget, it's going to be 75% of all of our spending will be what we call the mandatory, the entitlement. It is consuming us as a people. Your government is very quickly becoming a health insurer with a shrinking army. We need the president to stop pushing policies that attack our wealth, our job creation engines. The fantasy of things like the Buffett rule may be great politics, but it's not good for this country. Mr. Speaker, I yield my time back. I thank the gentleman for uh, yielding and uh, reclaiming my time. Um, the, the gentleman mentioned the Buffett rule, and maybe I'll talk about that as well uh, very briefly here, because I think the uh, gentleman from Arizona did a, a great job in, in showing that this is uh, really all about politics, as all this uh, so-called Buffett rule policy is. Um, there's uh, uh, a gentleman named Charles Krauthammer, uh, who happens to be, I believe, uh, one of the uh, smartest, uh, most interesting uh, political uh, commentators, uh, pundits, uh, in the land. And uh, I saw him talk about the Buffett rule and what a farce it is the other evening. And he illustrated it a little bit differently, but it's the same uh, type of illustration, one that brings it, I think, down to earth. He indicated he had the numbers run on this from a very reputable organization. And if the dollars were collected from the so-called, on the Buffett tax for the next 250 years, 
So the next 250 years this tax is collected, and he commented that that is uh, longer than the Republic has been in existence. Uh, the United States of America, this is longer than our existence. So you collect it for the next 250 years. Do you know how much we would actually uh, collect from that relative to the deficit, which is what this is supposed to do, pay down the deficit? It wouldn't cover last year's deficit alone. So not one year of the Obama deficit would be covered by the so-called Buffett rule if we collected it for 250 years. So it's nothing but pure politics. Uh, don't be fooled by that. Now, Mr. Speaker, as small businesses across the country uh, fight to make ends meet and stay out of debt, the federal government continues to dig itself into a hole with its exorbitant spending habits. Small businesses are burdened with massive regulations brought on by Obamacare. They're further plagued by the threat of tax increases, significant tax increases next year should the relief from the 2001 and 2003 tax cuts be allowed to expire. And that's what some people, uh, particularly those on the other side of the aisle, would like to happen. They would like the tax cuts to go away. In other words, if tax cuts go away, taxes go up. And this wasn't on the very wealthy, it was on virtually all Americans, middle class folks, uh, people that take advantage of the child tax credit, a whole range of people in the middle and yes, at upper income levels as well. Um, so a lot of folks would be hit very hard uh, with this, particularly small business folks, because uh, the so-called wealthy in this country, many of them are small business folks. Again, as I mentioned before, 70% of the jobs in this country are created by those folks. So if you're trying to bring unemployment rate down, why would you want to uh, put additional burdens on the people that are actually creating the jobs? Uh, Mr. Speaker, tax issues are the single most significant set of regulatory burdens for most small businesses. A recent NFIB Research Foundation study, the NFIB, by the way, is the National Federation of Independent Businesses, that study found that four of the top ten small business problems were tax-related. Just this week, struggling families and businesses were forced to give the government more of their hard-earned money to satisfy the hungry appetite of government bureaucracies. Mr. Speaker, enough's enough. Confiscatory tax rates and fiscal irresponsibility have got to come to an end. Small businesses across the country are fighting to keep their doors open and keep their lights on. It's shameful for the federal government to expect these hardworking taxpayers to foot the bill for GSA excursions to Las Vegas and inept corporate schemes like Solyndra, while the backbone of our economy, which is the small businesses, continue to suffer. After all, American small businesses are responsible, as I said before, for 70 percent of the jobs that are created in this country. Why do we want to continue to make life so difficult for them? Why are they the target for the left in this house so often? The America I know is a nation where hard work creates opportunities for success. After all, that's what our forefathers were seeking in the first place. At the founding of our nation, small business owners came to this land to escape excessive taxation and cumbersome regulation. These were families of farmers and builders, traders, inventors, and merchants. It's disheartening that today it's our very own government that's creating uh, the job-killing taxation and regulation. Our economy is still struggling to rebound from the worst recession since the Great Depression and we must support the engine that will propel America forward. This engine has always been fueled by hard work and an economic climate that rewards success. When I'm back home in my district in greater Cincinnati, I make a point to frequently meet with small business owners to talk about their successes as well as their struggles. I too often hear that the burden of taxes and regulations coupled with great uncertainty is keeping these businesses from growing and in many cases even forcing many of them to close their doors altogether. That's why I'm a co-sponsor of H.R. 9, the Small Business Tax Cut Act. If passed, this legislation would amend the Internal Revenue Code to allow American businesses a tax deduction of 20 percent. 
this is common sense. It's a fair bill that would help small business owners to keep more of what they've earned to invest in expansion and hiring. That's the important thing, hiring Americans who now need those jobs. We still have over 8 percent that are unemployed. I urge my colleagues to support this critical legislation that will be a shot in the arm to small businesses across the nation. And if there are any of my uh, colleagues that would uh, uh, have any additional things they'd like to say, we would welcome them at this time. If not, I've got a few more. Can I ask the, uh, the speaker how, many, uh, how much time do we have left? The gentleman has 16 minutes remaining. How many, six? 16. Okay. All right. The, um, one of the other issues that we haven't covered too much here, and, and let me talk about this very briefly, uh, is the impact that the high cost of energy, gasoline in particular, uh, what kind of difficulty that's causing small businesses uh, across the country. Because I hear this all the time uh, from my small business uh, constituents. And, you know, it's not surprising that energy prices and gas prices in particular have been going up so much. They're double, uh, the gas prices alone at the pump, they're double uh, what they were when the Obama administration uh, took over, and that's, that's most unfortunate. But it's really not surprising when, when you consider that the person that President Obama appointed to be the head of energy in this country, uh, the chief mind about energy and what we should do about it. It's the Secretary of Energy, Stephen Chu. Stephen Chu, a couple of months before President Obama appointed him to that position, said that it was his goal. What we ought to try to do, what we ought to strive for, is to raise the price of gasoline in this country, energy costs, prices of gasoline, for example, to European levels. Think of that. Now, they've got approximately, it depends on the country you're talking about, but it's around $9 a gallon. They do liters over there, but it's about $9 a gallon. Um, now, we're not there yet, but unfortunately, we're well on our way. It's approaching $4 back in my district in, in Cincinnati. Uh, here in Washington, just the other day, I had to uh, fill up, and it was about $4.50. So we're not quite there yet, um, but we're, we're approaching that. Um, it, it's just un, it's unbelievable uh, that we're in this state, um, but really I guess shouldn't be surprising when you consider that the person that President Obama put in control of our energy policy here in this country said that it was his goal to get energy prices up to European levels. And as I say, unfortunately, uh, we're, we're well on our way. And those gas prices, that's what the delivery trucks have to pay for the small business folks that are delivering things to, to towns or, uh, or the, the other things. Getting uh, products from other manufacturers when they come in, they cost more. So they can't charge uh, the consumers as much, or if they do, they drive those folks away. It's just, it's a vicious circle. We need to get energy prices down in, in this country, and unfortunately, uh, they're on their way up. And another, I think, terrible mistake that this administration has made uh, is to basically shut the door on the Keystone Pipeline. This is, this is uh, oil uh, sands from uh, Canada, our friendly neighbor to the north, our largest supplier uh, of, of uh, petroleum, uh, by the way, is, is from Canada. And this is a pipeline that would mean significant numbers of jobs here in the United States tens of thousands of, of jobs, and if we ever needed jobs, we know it's now. And those are good paying jobs, many of them union jobs. But the president has decided that no, we're not going to make this decision until maybe after the election. So tens of thousands of jobs are at risk here. And what Canada's been pretty clear what they're going to do. If, if we're not going to accept the oil in our country and build the pipeline, it's quite likely that they'll go ahead and, and build this pipeline through Canada to British Columbia and ship that oil that ought to be going to the U.S. to China, you know, one of our biggest competitors in many ways, to China. Um, and if you know anything about China, the environmental controls that they have over there are far weaker than what we have in the United States. So if your goal is to make sure that you're protecting the, the environment, and that's what many of the, the president's allies, the really radical left-wing environmentalists who are, who are fighting against the Keystone Pipeline, uh, if, if you buy the argument 
uh, what they're saying, they want to protect the environment by not having that oil come, come down here and be refined in, in the Gulf. But the controls we have here are much stronger than what they are over in China. So the, you're not protecting uh, the environment at all uh, or climate change or anything else if you're going to allow them to spew out uh, what, what they usually do in, in China when, when they handle uh, refining and, and manufacturing oftentimes and, and a lot of other things. And we all know, we all know uh, how, the, how the, uh, the administration and their support for an organization like uh, Solyndra, how much tax dollars uh, were wasted uh, it, it, there, and, and it goes on and on. So the, the energy policy in this, in this country by this administration is impacting consumers, it's impacting you and me and anybody who goes, uh, fills up at the gas pump nowadays, but it's also adversely impacting small businesses and job creation. And the, another thing that, that this administration, I believe, has made a mistake, which is causing these high prices, is to continue to keep off limits uh, much of the outer continental shelf, uh, the Gulf, the moratorium was disastrous for jobs in, in the Gulf region after the spill down there. And yes, it should have been investigated uh, very thoroughly. But a lot of those, those uh, derricks, the old derricks, ended up leaving that area. They couldn't hold out with that cost, that expensive capital cost, over six months period of time. So they ended up off the coast of Brazil, uh, for example. And, and the president uh, famously said, uh, we'll be happy to buy your oil. Uh, Brazil. Well, you know, we can look at it oil all, all around the world, but we ought to be self-sufficient. And the president said he was interested in being uh, energy self-sufficient in this country, but his policies are anything but that. So he continues to put uh, off limits much of the outer continental shelf, uh, the disaster in the Gulf, uh, Anwar up in Alaska. Uh, the administration has continued to put off limits. Now, all these things, we do need to, what we do, in an environmentally safe manner. And we have the ability to do that now. But again, this administration has shut this down. Um, that's affecting all of us in higher and higher gas prices. So it's, it's, uh, it's long overdue for this administration uh, to take a look, a long, hard look at what their policies are doing to the country uh, and, and to reconsider this to allow us to go after oil that we have available to us uh, clean coal, uh, natural gas, a whole range of, of fuels that we have here in this country uh, so we don't have to be buying that from, from countries that oftentimes don't have our best interest uh, at heart. And it sends a lot of money over to countries uh, that uh, unfortunately a lot of the terrorism that's endangered the world and endangered us has come from that region. So those dollars aren't always spent in, in a way that's going to help the United States. So uh, it's time for the administration to, uh, uh, to turn its policies around. Uh, and uh, Mr. Speaker, with, uh, without further ado, I will uh, yield back the uh, balance of my time. <clears throat> Under the Speaker's announced policy of January 5, 2011, the gentleman from Connecticut, Mr. Courtney, is recognized for 60 minutes as the designee of the minority leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, uh, and I appreciate the opportunity to uh, spend some time on the floor this evening, and I will be joined by other colleagues, uh, we, we anticipate, uh, to talk about an issue which is front and center for uh, millions of families all across the country. Uh, as my poster next to me uh, indicates, uh, there is a, actually a very critical uh, deadline that's approaching this country in terms of the issue of higher education affordability, about helping families pay for college, one of the biggest challenges that middle class families face today. Uh, back in 2007, mm -hmm. Congress made a very positive, progressive mood, move when it enacted the College Cost Reduction Act, a measure which uh, addressed issues that have been long neglected by prior Congresses in terms of helping students and families pay for college. The College Cost Reduction Act, in particular, 
uh, took aim at the Stafford Student Loan Program, a loan program that helps uh, lower income and middle income students pay for college. It's a program which has been on the books since the, the 1960s, but over the late 1990s into the early 2000s, the interest rate in the Stafford Student Pro Loan Program had fluttered upwards to 6.8 percent, almost the same levels at what private banks were offering for student loans. The College Cost Reduction Act in 2007 uh, correctly uh, moved forward to cut the interest rate for that program to uh, make it more affordable for students, uh, again, who are facing ever-rising tuition increases in both public and private universities and colleges, two-year programs, you name it, all across the country. And as a result of that measure, which passed by a bipartisan uh, vote in this House, we had 77 Republicans, which joined the Democratic majority that was in control at that time, uh, sent it to the Senate. Uh, uh, approximately two dozen Republicans voted in favor of the Stafford Student Loan Program, and it was sent to President Bush, uh, who signed it into law. That measure has helped 15 million students with lower interest rate costs pay for college. Uh, that measure was sunset. Uh, it, it had an expiration date of July 1st, 2012, and as my poster indicates, that's a date which today is 73 days away for families and students who today are trying to budget for next year's school year. That um, deadline uh, will, in effect, return the interest rate back to where it was uh, back in 2007, it will double the interest rate from 3.4 percent to 6.8 percent unless Congress acts. President Obama, during his State of the Union address, alerted this Congress and the nation to the fact that at a time when student loan debt now exceeds credit card debt and car debt, uh, we must, as a Congress, move quickly to make sure that we lock in that rate at 3.4 percent. Otherwise, students who use this program, it's been calculated, will, in, will have added debt levels of between five and ten thousand dollars. Now, in terms of you know the stakes that exist right now for what that means, this chart, which is from uh, figures produced by the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, shows again vividly the challenge that we face as a nation. That student loan debt now, as I mentioned earlier, exceeds credit card debt. Uh, it exceeds car loan debt. Uh, for many families, particularly if you're uh, talking about uh, going to a four-year private college, it literally is like buying a house uh, to try and figure out ways to pay for college. So if we do not act, if we do not lock in that lower rate of 3.4 percent between now and July 1st, the 73-day deadline that we face literally as we stand here today, we will in fact compound that bar graph which shows again rising debt levels for students who are trying to pay for college. The stakes could not be bigger for our nation. Back in the 1980s, America was number one in terms of graduation rates across the world. Today, the National College Board, which tracks this data uh, and has been doing it for decades, um, reports to us that the U.S. now ranks 12th in the world in terms of graduation rates. That is a dynamic for mediocrity. That is a dynamic that says that our country is not going to be able to produce the workforce that we need for the future in terms of facing all the technological challenges, all the competitive challenges that we face uh, as a nation. And we here in Congress have that power within our hands to at least avoid worsening the situation that, again, has now, in my opinion, reached epidemic cr critical proportions in terms of this, this country's capacity to, to refresh uh, its workforce. The Republican majority um, has leadership which recently talked about this issue. Uh, the chairwoman of the Higher Education Subcommittee, uh, when asked last week on a radio program about uh, the issue of student loan debt, uh, basically stated very clearly that she has very little tolerance for people who tell me that they graduate with $200,000 of debt or even $80,000 of debt because there's no reason for that. Well, this morning's Wall Street Journal had a very uh, long story about exactly one of the, the couples, the uh, couple with the, who were in exactly this predicament. Uh, where they are carrying $74,000 of student loan debt, 
making monthly payments of approximately $900 a month. And the headline basically is that student loan debt uh, is deferring marriage and children uh, for young people. And frankly, that is a, uh, an issue which is being compounded in terms of young people being able to go out and look for work and not be haunted or burdened, almost smothered and buried by, credit, by student loan debt. And that affects the vitality of our economy. It affects really the career path of, of many of our young people who at that point in life really should be maximizing their um, uh, attempts to really experiment and to innovate and to, to be, again, the leaders of, of a new generation in terms of, of taking this country uh, to new heights. This is a sad statement of the priorities of the majority that's controlling this Congress, which, again, at a point where we literally have before us in 73 days a choice to make in terms of whether or not we are going to avoid this explosion in interest rates, we have a leadership which basically says they have no sympathy or tolerance. You know, as we're sitting here tonight, um, Capitol Hill is, again, being visited in members' offices uh, day, uh, hour after hour by organizations like dental st um, students, nursing students, uh, folks who, again, are very excited about starting their careers and, and um, have issues about policy that we're uh, 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 taking up here in their different uh, uh, professions. And, but in each instance, when you asked a dental student, well, what kind of student loan debt do you have? Or a nurse anesthetist, what kind of student loan debt do you have? And they were in my office just a couple of days ago. In every instance, their debt levels exceeded the levels that the chairwoman of the Higher Education Subcommittee was talking about. We need a Congress which is not out of touch with middle class families and young people in this country. We need a Congress which is ready to move forward with uh, the need to lock in that lower interest rate so that, again, that we do not compound this problem of, of student loan debt skyrocketing in increases. There is legislation which is pending, H.R. 3826, uh, a measure which I introduced, and now we have uh, over 120 co-sponsors in the House Democratic Caucus. I'm joined here this evening by some of the folks who uh, have joined in that effort uh, that would lock in that rate, that would say that, you know what, um, this is a priority that really matters in terms of the future of this country, which is to invest in young people, to help middle class families uh, deal with, again, probably as big a challenge as either buying a home or trying to save uh, and prepare for retirement. And for us, at a time when the Federal Reserve Bank is lending money almost for free, when uh, home mortgage interest rates are uh, about 3.1% for a 30-year mortgage and even lower for a variable rate, to say that we are going to stand here and turn our backs and allow interest rates for the Stafford Student Loan Program, the, one of the workhorse bedrock programs for middle-class families to pay for college, to go from 3.4% to 6.8% is unconscionable. It is unforgivable. Uh, and it, we, we cannot let this happen. And here this evening on the floor, I've been joined by some members who uh, agree and have been working hard on this issue back home, getting the word out in their states, and also have co-sponsored this legislation and have joined us to talk a little bit about this issue from their perspective. Congressman Cicilline from uh, Rhode Island was here first, and I am pleased to, to uh, yield to my neighbor from, from Rhode Island. Uh, and uh, thank you, sir, for, uh, for joining us here this evening. Thank you. I thank the gentleman from Connecticut for his extraordinary leadership on this issue, which is uh, important to Rhode Island, but really important to uh, students all across our country. And I think one of the things that has struck me during this uh, debate about this issue in the last several weeks as, as uh, we've tried to bring attention to this issue is that this is really a, a moment in the history of our country where we need to recognize, maybe more than any time, at least in my lifetime, the urgency of investing in education and in ensuring that young people have access to a quality education. And the, the idea that we're in a position to prevent interest rates from doubling for those who are benefiting from Stafford student loans, and that this Congress seems poised not to do anything about it, um, to me is, as you said, unconscionable. And there was a report that was done recently, the Georgetown University Center on Education and the Workforce, and they found that over the period from 2008 to 2018, about 47 million job openings will be created. And of that, more than 30 million of these jobs will require at least some level of post-secondary education. So this is the reality for our country that we have got to realize that if we're going to create jobs 
and be sure that we have young people who have the skills necessary to fill those jobs in this new knowledge economy of the 21st century, we have to make it easier for people to access higher education, not more difficult. And, and, the, and Congress wisely cut the rate in half from 6.8% to 3.4%. We have to make sure it stays there. Now, I come from a state uh, that, that, that brought us the great Senator Claiborne Pell, who was the creator of the Pell Grants, which created and continue to create hope and opportunity and access to education for millions and millions of Americans, um, really unlocking uh, opportunity and, and, and keys to success. Now, we all understand that not only the student benefits from that education, but we all benefit, the community benefits, when we have a well-educated group of young people that are making new discoveries, that are finding cures for diseases, that are inventing new products, that are building productive lives to support themselves and their families. And this is a, a moment when we have to be sure that we're protecting families from the consequences of this kind of uh, interest rate increase, doubling, as you just said, uh, Representative. Uh, the United States Public Interest Research Group says that without congressional action, Borrowers who have taken out the maximum $23,000 in subsidized student loans will see their interest balloon to an additional $5,200 over a 10-year repayment and $11,300 over a 20-year repayment. So this is a huge increase for families, many of whom in my state where we continue to have very high unemployment, the second highest in the country, where families are struggling with uh, the, the consequences of a housing crisis and difficulty finding work. This, this cannot, um, this, we cannot allow this to happen. It will cause incredible hardship for families in Rhode Island and my district. I was recently at Roger Williams University, at several other universities in my, in my district, you know, meeting with young people, all who are concerned about, will Pell Grants continue? Will we be able to protect Pell Grants? And what's going to happen when they graduate and, and have student loans? Are these kinds of interest rates going to be um, in existence then, which are just not affordable to young people? And the idea that we have 73 days, you know, this is a moment where we can demonstrate we can get something done. My friends on the other side of the aisle don't seem interested in addressing this issue, which for Rhode Islanders, and I know uh, you recently had an event in Connecticut, and I know many of our colleagues around the country are doing this. We've got to rally young people to demand that the legislation uh, which you uh, sponsored, H.R. 3826, and which I'm proud to be a co-sponsor of, uh, and my senator, Senator Reid, on the Senate side is the lead sponsor. We've got to demand that Speaker Boehner bring this to the floor for a vote. Our colleagues need to hear from their, young, their families and their districts, from young people all across this country, this is about our own investment in our future as a country, that we benefit from young people who have access to higher education uh, at a time when our, where our economy is still recovering. We cannot allow interest rates on student loans to double. Uh, I'm going to continue to fight very hard. I thank the gentleman for his leadership on this. I hope that we will continue to ha beat the drums on this for the next 73 days till we force some action here on the floor of the House for the sake of the young people in this country and for the sake of our future as a thriving and prosperous democracy. And I again thank the gentleman for the opportunity to speak to this issue tonight. Thank you, Congressman Cicilline. And uh, I'm glad you mentioned Senator Reid. Actually, we had an um, event in front of the Capitol a couple weeks ago where Public Interest Research Group uh, dropped off 130,000 petition signatures from college <coughs> campuses all across.